Hey guys. Hi. Look at those beautiful children. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Addie, how are you, pal? Mr. Vice President, Dr. Biden, thanks for doing this. Before we start, I want to introduce you to my wife, Rachel, and our two kids, Carl and Willow. Well, thank you. We can see the top of Willow. There we see Willow. She's beautiful. I love her. Why don't you tell Carl we have for him? Look, Carl, do you, do you like dogs? No, we have, we have two dogs. We have two German Shepherds. We can send you a picture of one. This is, this is Champ. He's our stuffed German Shepherd. He's out in the other room. But we'll send you one if you like dogs. He likes to be hugged, though. He likes to be cuddled. Can you do that? Yeah. And do you, would you like this one for your sister, Willow? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll send them both then. Thank you. Okay, well, Great. I think we'll let, let you guys have your longer chat, but thank you so much. It was wonderful to meet you. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for making the time for this conversation. I am only able to communicate with you because of this miraculous technology that follows the movement of my eyes. As I struggled with how to make use of my few remaining years, I discovered that I could find meaning and purpose and even joy by connecting my struggle with the struggles of other people. If I made my personal tragedy about more than me. I want the American people to raise their voices because this really is an opportunity for folks to reclaim our democracy. I could find solidarity with others. By hitching my destiny to that of past and future freedom fighters, I could even transcend my dying body. Well, look, Eddie, uh, I obviously have not felt or have the pain or the destiny at the moment that you have, but uh, I'd always say to President Obama, life has a way of intruding. I was 30 years old, top of the world, second youngest man in American history ever to be elected a United States senator. I found myself in a situation where I was in Washington, not old enough to be sworn in when I got elected. And I got a phone call. And a poor first responder was scared to death and said, you must come home. Your wife and daughter are dead. Your two boys are not likely to live. It changed everything. A tractor trailer broadside at my wife, Christmas shopping on December 18th, killed her instantly. Kill my daughter instantly, and my two boys weren't supposed to make it. Mr. Vice President, that tragic accident happened 11 years to the day before I was born. So we are connected together forever by December 18th. And then I was uh, running again. Our son was deployed to Iraq for a year. He was the Attorney General of the state, a better man than me. He came home a decorated war veteran, Bronze Star, Conspicuous Service Cross, etc. And he was given up to a year to live because he had contracted stage four glioblastoma. And what I've learned is, for me, that the only way at least I've ever been able to deal with pain, and there's so many people like you and others who have had it worse than I have had and get up every day and move on and people think they're being nice to you and they tell you I know how you feel and I'm sure people say I understand what you're going through and you look at them and you want to say what the hell are you talking about you have no idea how I feel you know they mean well they don't know what to say you know there's that great quote from Kierkegaard he said faith sees best in the dark my dad used to say Joey what makes you so special you think you're exempt from pain. And uh, what I decided to do for me was to deal with the things that uh, gave me purpose. Presumptuous to me, but I'm so damn proud of you. No, I really mean it. I mean, it takes enormous, enormous, enormous fortitude, courage, and belief. But like me, you have somebody who adores you, knows who you are, respects you, and you got those two beautiful children. That means a great deal. Thank you.
I was moved to hear your speech a few weeks ago in Philadelphia, where you said this about your son, Bo, passing. There's still moments when the pain is so great. It feels no different than the day I sat in that bed as he passed away. But I also know that the best way to bear loss and pain is to turn it into that anger and anguish into purpose. So I wanted to thank you for that sentiment. And I wanted to ask you about your purpose. Why did you decide to run for president again? What do you feel is your purpose in this moment? After Bo died, I decided I was never going to run again. And even though I had already started a plan to run and put together a campaign, the beginning of a campaign, he said, Dad, if anybody asked about me, just tell him he's okay. He's going to be fine. I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me, Dad. So I couldn't tell anybody that I wasn't going to run, even the people I'd put together as a staff. And when he passed, I decided that um, I was never going to run again. And he said, but dad, promise me you're going to be okay. I said, I'll be okay, honey. And so I made a commitment that I'd stay engaged, but I hadn't planned on running. And then when those, those folks came out of the fields in Charlottesville, carrying those torches, chanting an anti-Semitic bile with their veins bulging, breathing hatred, a young woman was killed and the president was asked, what do you think? He said, they're very fine people on both sides. No president has ever in American history said anything like that. And that's when I decided I had to get involved. I had to get involved and run. And so that's a long answer to a short question, but it's as honest as I can be with you. Because it is the purpose. A few months after I was diagnosed with ALS, Rachel, and I traveled to Japan to try a treatment that had not yet been approved for use in the United States, I learned that nearly all people in Japan who get ALS decide to get tracheostomy so they can continue living with the help of a ventilator. In the United States, only about 5 to 10 percent of ALS patients do and the rest choose to die. The huge difference is due to the fact that in Japan, the government covers long-term care as part of its universal health care program. As we age and or become disabled, the vast majority of Americans want to stay in our homes, close to the people and places we love. But in America, our current public policies make this exceptionally difficult for most people. The COVID pandemic and resulting economic depression has also proven that institutions are not safe. Over 30,000 people have died from COVID-19, just in nursing homes. Over 30 million people are unemployed and the crisis is particularly acute for Latina and black women. More than 20% of home care workers are below the poverty line. Polling shows that Americans would overwhelmingly support guaranteeing everyone the right to long-term care. So my question is this, will you be a champion for the millions of Americans like me and fight to strengthen Medicare so that it includes home-based and community-based long-term services and supports? The idea that we're the only really industrialized nation in the world that doesn't provide childcare, long-term care. You have 80% of the American people who are part of the generation that I happen to be part of. They would rather live in their homes than be in a nursing home. We need to be able to put people in a position where they're nurses' aides, where they can go back to school and gain additional certification. One of the things I got deeply involved in as a consequence of the war was our veterans coming home, disabled veterans. All the data shows they recover better or they live longer and they are happier if they're cared for by a family member. You should be paid while you're taking that leave from work to take care of a family member a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife. That should be done. So I will send you, for your folks to take a look at, the detail of the plan that I think relates to what I call home care and make, giving people the dignity. Everything, my dad used to have an expression. He said, Joey, everyone's entitled to be treated with dignity. Dignity. Everyone. And the indignity of having someone that you love, needing your time, care, and attention, 
And the only way you could provide it is to have to quit your job and leave your income behind to do it, which people can't do, or leave them in other care that you cannot afford. That is the ultimate lack of affording people dignity. For example, I couldn't imagine as Bo was lying there, literally close to taking his last breath in serious pain for the last five months of his life, bedridden, hooked up to machines. If someone had come along and said, guess what? You've, out, you've, you've outlived your coverage. Suffer in peace the next four months or five months you live. It's up to you. Good luck. I, I made a commitment. I will fight for the care and well-being of everyone as if they were my son, my daughter, my wife, all of whom went through hell. And so what I'm proposing is something that costs in excess of a trillion dollars. And we're going to get it done. Thank you for that commitment and that bold agenda. It's no secret that I support Medicare for all. I don't and that I endorsed Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders in the primary. Both good people. But you won the nomination and I respect that and I am fully committed to beating Donald Trump. I know that. Throughout the Democratic primary, you made clear your opposition to single-payer, Medicare for all, and you have won the nomination. But in recent months, 20 million Americans have lost their jobs and many have lost their health insurance with it. Democrats overwhelmingly support Medicare for all and it's especially popular among young people. And even your friend, Barack Obama, said recently that it is a good idea. Democrats aren't just running on good old ideas, they're running on good new ideas, like Medicare for all. So my question is, do you see a future where health insurance is no longer tied to employment? Will America ever have a single-payer system where health care is guaranteed as a human right? Health care guaranteed as human right? But taking away the right to have a private plan, if you want a private plan, I disagree with. I disagree with. There's three things that I propose that we can do, and we can do it quickly. I support a public option as well. We can get a public option passed, and we can get it passed quickly, number one. Number two, I propose spending almost a trillion dollars to make sure that people can get a goal plan in Obamacare, subsidizing anyone who wants to get in with a goal plan. Number three, providing for the option to have home care paid for and elder care paid for, not as part of Medicare, as, a, as just a basic right, just an absolute basic right. And so I believe we can do all the things you want to do and do them better more quickly than with Medicare for all. But we have the same goal because health care is a right, not a privilege. It should be a right, not a privilege. Vice President, I hope you understand this issue is personal for me. This isn't abstract or theoretical. When I say I'm a Medicare for all advocate, I hope you understand it's because I've spent hours on hold with my insurance companies when they won't cover the cost of my care. It's because I've had to sue insurance companies when they tell me I need to pay thousands of dollars out of my own pocket for the cost of full-time care. And I have a great private insurance plan. I understand what you are saying about keeping private plans. But I guess my question is, what does preserving private insurance really do for people? It depends on the plan. Look, you know what my bills were for my hospitalization? For $280,000. I get it, man. I'm not new to this. I'm not where you are. But I get it. I fully get it. The cost of my son we're well over a million dollars. That's why we have to do the additional things, like making sure that home health care is covered. Over 100,000 people have died from COVID, and our nurses are still not getting the proper protective equipment they need because of the true failure of Donald Trump. Absolutely. Zenny, a nurse, has a question for you. My name is Zenny Cortez, and I'm from the city of San Bruno, and I've been a nurse for four decades. I've worked through SARS, H1N1, and this is so unprecedented. Mr. Vice President, nurses know from direct experience that everyone should be guaranteed healthcare as a human right. 
We see this so starkly in this moment while COVID-19 is spreading across the world and close to 30 million in the United States are losing their employer-sponsored health insurance while unprecedented numbers are getting sick and requiring hospitalization. I know we're working hard to develop a vaccine, but how will your administration ensure that everyone in this country gets the healthcare they need now during this pandemic and into the future? Two things, by the way, if there are any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female. Your docs let you live, nurses make you wanna live because you give us hope. That's the most important thing, number one. Anyone who needs a test, the vaccination, and or is suffering from COVID, that will be totally covered by the federal government across the board, period. All of it covered, period. Number two, I plan on setting up a program for $50 billion for HARP, that is, do the same thing at the Department of Health with a separate agency looking for cures. One of them is ALS. The other one is making sure we deal with Alzheimer's. The third one is to deal with cancer. And the fourth one is to deal with diabetes because they're all contributing factors to have immune system irregularities that no one's spending the money on. If we can spend $50 billion doing the things we're doing on other things from tax cuts to the military, we sure in hell can make that investment in looking for cures, getting the best scientists in the world engaged and focusing on those things. And by the way, I lay out pay for us, how I pay for each of these things, where they come from, how, what we do to pay for it, how we raise the money to do it, how it generates additional funding. Thank you for that leadership. Budgets are fundamentally moral documents laying yes. out our genuine priorities. The United States spends $700 billion every year on our military, but only $40 billion on biomedical research. That's a major contributing factor to why Bo's cancer was untreatable, and why I am paralyzed by ALS. We simply aren't dedicating enough resources to find cures. In your first budget proposal to Congress, will you show your commitment to changing that reality by calling to double the budget of the NIH? Doubling the budget of the NIH will not get where you want to go. It costs a lot of money to double. I would significantly increase the budget and I would set up this separate entity, this ARPA-H. I would commit to making sure we spend another $50 billion on biomedical research in addition to what's going on at NIH, in addition to that. So it's not merely the money, it is the money. That's really important. We vastly will increase the NIH's budget. But in addition to that, there has to be a section of NIH like at the Defense Department, in my view, that seeks specific answers and tries to develop the actual drug or product that's going to help deal with the disease. Excuse my interruption, but is that $50 billion per year or over 10 years? It's the first four years, $50 billion. I think that is not enough. Well, maybe when I get elected, you can come and help me figure out what's enough. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'll take you up on that. The World Health Organization is leading an unprecedented global effort to promote international cooperation in the search for COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. But Donald Trump has refused to join that effort, cutting America off from the rest of the world. If the U.S. discovers a vaccine first, will you commit to sharing that technology with other countries? And will you ensure there are no patents to stand in the way of other countries and companies mass-producing those life-saving vaccines? Absolutely, positively. This is the only humane thing in the world to do. Were I president now, and I propose we do it now, set aside $25 billion to put together a plan now, now, this instant, how we will distribute that vaccine when it's made available to guarantee it gets to every American and access is made available to the rest of the world. This guy's whole idea of America, America on its own is meant America alone. We're out there by ourselves. What's he doing? It lacks any human dignity. 
what we're doing? So the answer is yes, 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 yes. And it's not only a good thing to do, it's overwhelmingly in our interest to do it as well. Overwhelmingly. Thank you for that commitment. The most painful part of having ALS is thinking about all of the experiences that I don't get to have with my children. I can't chase Carl around the house and make him laugh with silly dances. I can't squeeze little Willow and kiss her head. And I am heartbroken when I think about the decades of joy that I will probably miss out on. I know we share this pain and I cannot imagine what it would be like to lose my children. George Floyd had five children. Breonna Taylor was only 26 and had decades of hopes and dreams ahead of her. But America's commitment to white supremacy stole away those relationships and those futures. The leaders of the movement for black lives believe that we have been trying to reform police departments for many decades and it is not working. Instead, they believe that the solution is to reduce the number of interactions that civilians have with the police. We can reduce the responsibilities assigned to the police and redirect some of the funding for police into social services, mental health counseling, and affordable housing. So for example, instead of sending two police officers with deadly weapons to that Wendy's drive through in Atlanta, we could have sent a wellness counselor and a tow truck, and then Ray's Hard Brooks would still be alive today. And his three daughters would still have their daddy. Are you open to that kind of reform? Yes, I propose that kind of reform. We need significantly more help. That's why I call for significant increase in funding for mental health clinics and mental health pr providers. We are desperately in need of that now. One of the things I've been pushing for in our administration, we put together the ability in a bill that I wrote to make sure that we can look at pattern and practice of police departments, go in and get all the records and find out what they're doing. That's why we're able to stop the stop and frisk in Camden, the stop and frisk in New York City and the rest, where the federal government has the right to go in and, and change systemically what's going on. There's a whole range of things that we can do. The idea of no-knock warrants for drug cases is bizarre. We don't need that. It's, it's just, it just invites trouble. That's how Brianna was killed. There's a need for fundamental change in us being have, able to have transparency, be able to have access to the records of police when they have misconduct charges against them, to be able to know where they are. So they can't go from one police department to the next. That should be held in my administration. That information will have to be made available to the Justice Department and held in a file. So you'd be able to track this. Uh, surplus military equipment for law enforcement. They don't need that. The last thing you need is an up-armored Humvee coming into a neighborhood. It's like the military invading. They don't know anybody. They become the enemy. They're supposed to be protecting these people. So my generic point is but that do we agree that we can redirect some of the funding. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that we also need to be doing is fundamentally changing the way and I've been pushing it for years, changing the way we deal with our prison system. It should be a rehabilitation system, not a punishment system. We're going to make sure that you're qualified for every single right you had before you went to prison if you served your time. And that means that you're entitled to Pell Grants to go to school. You're entitled to job training programs. You're entitled to housing grants. You're entitled to every federal program out there. One last question, Vice President Biden. I can't imagine there isn't a moment that this campaign is not in some way bittersweet. Even though it sometimes feels impossible, I keep fighting for health care and doing the work I do for my son, Carl, and my daughter, Willow. I just want them to be proud of me. From everything I have heard and read, your son, Bo, was an exceptional man. I am so sorry for your loss. If he were with us today, what do you think he would be saying to the American people? What would be his guidance in this difficult hour? I think, I hope, he'd be saying, that my father is totally authentic. Whatever he says he'll do, he will try to do. He'll never mislead you. When he makes a mistake, he'll tell you he made a mistake and take responsibility. And even if it's not popular, he will push things that he feels are a matter of principle that relate to our values. 
I hope that's what he would say, because it is, um, my dad used to have an expression. He'd say, you know your success as a father if you turn and look at your child, realize he or she turned out better than you. When Bo died, Brock did the eulogy. He said Bo Biden was Joe 2.0. That's the whole thing, to be objective, have objective standards. I've been fairly successful, but my children have done better than I have done. Every day I ask, and I said, honest to God, truth, and you ask, you'll be asking yourself too, how are my kids going to remember me? Are they proud of me? That's why I do the work I do, to make sure that Willow and Carl are proud of me. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for this conversation. I am eager to do everything I can to help you win in November. And I look forward to having you as our president next year. I'm eager to get to you and your folks the remainder of what I call the entire health initiative that we have that goes beyond Obamacare with a public option or Medicare for all goes beyond that in terms of a whole new care network across the board of giving people more flexibility, allowing people to not have to make choices between their job and taking care of a parent who's dying. You have enough work you're doing already, but I, I mean this sincerely. I'd, I'd welcome your input and I'd welcome your constructive criticism. That means a great deal. No, I thank you. I mean it. One thing I th think you should not underestimate, and I mean this sincerely, is what an inspiration you are to so many people. So many people. You know what I'm talking about. Don't underestimate it. It means a lot. It means a lot to so many people. You give hope. You give hope. Thank you. Let's talk again soon. Okay. Keep the faith, man. Or as my grandma would say, spread it. Spread it. Thank you.